Hi, my name is Steve, and um, I'm going to stop saying um as well. I'm trying to work on that, as you might have seen from my previous video. Uh, we're going to talk today about our first video, our first real video, or my first real video called the first installment of The Kiss of Truth and Common Sense, called The Legitimate Heir to the Roman Empire. Now, what I'm going to try to show in this video is there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet about you know who who is the heir to the empire who's a, who legitimacy who where it's fallen from like you know how it goes from father to son and so forth like that so who inherits you know an empire and usually um an empire will cease to exist when it's conquered uh, what i'm going to try to show today is that there is actually a live legitimate heir to the roman empire today and right off the bat, I'm going to tell you it's not Russia. <laughs> so if you're looking for that, you might not want to watch the rest of this. But I try to use logic and common sense like I talked about before in my other, my first video. And I'm going to show you through some maps that I have. And I'm a big map guy. History maps, all kinds of stuff like that I'm really into. The map quality is very poor in this video. I do apologize for that. The ones I make after this won't be that way. But I think you can still see what I'm talking about. The maps actually come most mostly from some books, Penguin Atlas of Recent History, Ancient History, and so forth, by Colin McVitie. Um, he's been making maps and books of this series since the at least the early 80s, and I've purchased a lot of them, and I do find his books really interesting, and I'm hoping to transfer some of that knowledge to you here so that you can understand what I'm talking about and why I think that the Roman Empire still exists today. So... We're going to go on to a few slides. I'm going to show you step by step what's going on and try to be very simple, very simple, so that anybody can understand it and where I'm coming from. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. All right. So we're going to start with our um, first real slide here. And I do, again, I'm apologizing for the last time on the quality of the maps. And this is really the best I could do with what I have just starting out. I'm sure it'll get better. But um, the. What we have here in front of you, sorry, when I, when I tend to talk, I tend to get choked up a little bit. I do apologize. I, I don't know if it's just a fear thing or or what. Maybe because I'm eating lunch while I'm trying to do this. <laughs> I've been working on this for a while, and now I get frustrated that I can't get it done. Okay, so what you have here in front of you is a picture of Europe. Um, and what you see is about at its greatest extent, roughly, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire started off around 509 B.C. as a Roman city or just a city republic and grew and turned into an imperial empire. And what you see here now is roughly about its greatest extent, more or less. And what you also see is how it's divided between the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. The Western and Eastern Roman Empire split and came together a couple times during its history. The main capital around 300, 310, I think it was, from Constantine moved to Constantinople. Um, in Asia, between the, in Asia Minor, in the Bosporus Straits, and around 406 is when it split for the last time. And what you're seeing here is about that time between the Western and Eastern Roman Empire, and they would never be joined again. So where we're at now is you have the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire, and what's going to happen over history is who is the legitimate heir to the empire now, or at least as late as possible. Right now you have two, Western Roman Empire and Eastern Roman Empire, who have rights to claim that as the heir of the empire. So let's see what happens. Let's um, see what happens next. Now you might think that I would start with the Western Roman Empire since it's simple because they went away around 476. But actually I'm going to start with the East. Now the Eastern Empire existed basically from, its, from the split from 406 until... The famous date in 1453 when Constantinople fell, which isn't actually correct 100%, but we'll get to that. But we're going to go ahead and concentrate on the East because there's a reason why. So, as you see here, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire existed. It actually turned into what they call the Byzantine Empire. They never called themselves that, but it was easy because an easy way to distinguish them when they changed their empire. When it became a Greek Empire instead of a Latin Empire. So, in fact, um, we'll get into that a little bit too. Real quickly, uh, the East existed, and in its its present form, it pretty much existed until about the year 1200. Around the year 1200, 
what ended up happening to the Eastern Roman Empire, is what we're focusing on right now, is it kind of had some problems. First off, the uh, small piece of northern Anatolia, Anatolia split off and became the Empire of Trebizond, about 1204. And the emperor of the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, had a feud with the West about payment of funds, and the Western Roman Empire decided to run a crusade and basically sacked Constantinople. Really good use of resources, guys. <laughs> Unbelievable. So instead of an amphibious assault in Egypt, that was supposed to be the Fourth Crusade, I believe it was the Fourth Crusade, and take over more areas of the Holy Land, they decided, ah, we'll go after Constantinople and then instead. So we can see where the Crusades were going. So they sat Constantinople and put one of their own on the throne and called it the Latin Empire. So the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Emperor fled, and some rump states came up. Uh, Empire of Nicaea, as you can see here, the Despotate of Piraeus, Despotate of Rhodes, and so forth. Greek areas. So the Empire of the East split, but all of them had legitimate rights to call themselves heirs to the Eastern Roman Empire. So, just want to make sure I pointed that out, around 1200 there was a problem, and then they were split up, but all of those Greek states could claim um, heir to the Eastern Roman Empire. The Latin Empire could not because they conquered those areas. So they were still acting in the interest of the West, which we'll get into later. So we went from one to about four states now that can claim legitimate rights to the East Roman Empire around the year 1200. So let's go on to the next one. During the mid to late 1200s and early 1300s, the struggle to retake what was Byzantine or Eastern Empire lands from the Latin Empire continued. And for a lot of, uh, at the time, a lot of people thought that Slovenoka or the... Um, Slavic peoples, there was an empire there that was trying to get to Constantinople, but their leader died. And what ended up happening is the original house, or the ruling house of Constantinople, or the Byzantine Empire, before the Latin Empire came in, was able to come in and retake Constantinople area. And then immediately went into the, the European portion around Greece and took over a good substantial amount of land and the islands and the Aragon. Aegon Sea, and was able to have one last little um, time of of having a, a decent amount of land for their empire. So it retook it retook the area, but wasn't as strong as they used to be. So up until the middle, the beginning of the 1300s, they did have they were able to take over that area, except for the Empire of Trebizond, like I mentioned before. They kind of stayed off to the side and associated more with Georgia than anybody else, and for the remainder of their existence. So. Uh, Basically, the Byzantine Empire at this point, the old house of the old Eastern Roman Empire, took over the area again and had their had their last hurrah, uh, let's say. During the you know late 1300s, early 1400s, as you can tell by the map, the um, you started to see a lot of the Islamic tribes move in, take over a lot of large portions of the area. Obviously, the Crusader states are all gone now, and then the um, Turks and a few other tribes uh, moving into Asia Minor and pushing the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, out into the um, the very fringes of what is now Greece and the islands. Very limited amount of uh, territory. They're pretty much under the gun and they're falling short and they're about to be overrun. So as you can see from here, they're on their last leg and just hold just a little bit of territory uh, as far as uh, landmass goes. Okay, now where we reach now is kind of a pivotal moment, the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. What you see here is you see the Ottoman Empire kind of centralized in Asia Minor and Greek, Greek and in the uh, Balkan area. And this data map is actually dated 1483. We'll probably come back to this map for another purpose for the Western Empire, but what's key here, and I have to make sure everybody understands this, in 1453 Constantinople was conquered around 1461-ish. The last little piece that belonged to Byzantium down uh, at the end of Greece was also conquered. And if you look on the top near Georgia, Trebizond is also gone as well. They fell around 1461 as well. So what I'm trying to say here is every single state that belonged to the Eastern Roman Empire is gone and conquered. Since it's been conquered, 
there is no rights to any legitimate heir type of scenario. Nobody can inherit anything because it has been conquered, it's been overrun, it no longer exists. So there is no heir to the Eastern Roman Empire. It has been defeated and it has been wiped out. So from this point on, 1453, 1483, let's say, 1483, there is no, there are no remnants to the Eastern Roman Empire. So there is no heir to the Eastern Roman Empire. What we have to do now is see if there's any heir to the Western Roman Empire, which we're going to go ahead and do and um, do next. All right, now that we took care of the Eastern Roman Empire and pretty much explained why the anything from the East has basically been destroyed or conquered or gone away, so there is no heir to that. In fact, the heir would shift to the next legitimate heir would be the heirs to the Western Roman Empire. So now we need to see if there's any legitimate heir to the Western Roman Empire. So let's go back to the fall of the West, which is in 476. And actually, in 476, uh, Odoacer, I, I should pronounce that better, but I can't, um, was, a, was a soldier, and he basically took over. He, he basically said, hey, I'm in charge anyway, and he got rid of the emperor, basically is what happened. So he just took over control of the country. And you can get you can call that a civil war or a coup d'etat or whatever. Um, and he took over Italy and a little above Italy and around Italy. Now two other sections have to be considered parts of the uh, parts of different different areas that might legitimately be called the Western Empire. One was um, Emperor Nepos, who was overthrown before Romulus Augustus before the end of the, the 476, the end of the empire, and he controlled basically Bosnia, Bosnia area, Croatia area. And uh, there's actually a rumor that Odosir, or Dacier, poisoned him in 480 just to take over those lands. So, <laughs> whatever. And there's also, uh, I can't pronounce his name either, Sag Sagarius, up in northern France, who was a Roman patriarch or Roman citizen, and had an area, he had a rump state, they call it rump state, up in uh, northern France. And he held on to that until basically the Franks overran him and killed him and took over his area. Around, four, around the same time, I think it was 486 ish, where he fell. So, Odysseus is, is considered the inheritor of the Western Roman Empire. And the Eastern Roman, and actually the legitimacy for that is the Eastern Roman Emperor acknowledged him. So, as the ruler of the West. So, you kind of have to take that. So he was the ruler of the West, the East acknowledged him, and he ruled basically for a few years, and um, he ruled actually until, from 476 until 493, and then we can get into what happened, uh, what happened next. Okay, so after a period of time, Odysseus was ruling and the Eastern Empire didn't like what was going on and now that the Western Roman Empire has kind of fallen, the Eastern Roman Empire was intact as actually, not, it wasn't so much a who was heir to the kingdom and legitimate heir and all that, the Eastern Roman Empire still existed so they kind of felt they could dictate ter dictate terms for the West so since they acknowledged Odysseus, they decided after a while they didn't like him anymore so they encouraged the Ostrogoths who were living on the edge of his empire or edge of his kingdom to go in and take over so some people might think that Odysseus was conquered. I still look at it as a transition of power determined by the East. So it's, it's kind of a gray area. But for the purpose, I like everything to be linear and follow a set pattern. So I look at it as another takeover, to coup d'etat, whatever. So now you see on this map here that Odysseus' kingdom becomes the kingdom of the Ostrogoths. And they actually had a little more territory they added to it, as you can see. You see everything else from the West is gone. Uh, Realm of the Franks up to the left. It was actually a kingdom in Africa that existed for a little while. I think that fell. That they tried to say that they were the Western Roman Empire, where the Vandals are now. Uh, that ceased to exist around 490s or so. So, so around this time, from 493 until 553, the Ostrogoths were in charge of the Western Roman Empire. And some people might not like the way I did that, but you know what? It doesn't really matter so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and go into the next slide uh, where I'm going to show you why it really doesn't matter. Uh, keep, keep in mind what you are at. We're at 553 AD, so you kind of you might know already what's happening next. What happened on or about 553 AD is Justinian came into charge of the Eastern Roman Empire. Justinian the Great and he, his general Belisarius 
decided to go ahead and let's go ahead and try to take over all the Western Empire lands and become one Roman Empire again. That was his dream, one of his dreams anyway. And as you can see from this map, uh, dated about that time, about 460-ish, they did a pretty good job at it. They had the East, which kind of stayed the same, and then they had Italy, uh, North, North Africa, part of Spain. Did a pretty decent job at it and didn't, didn't have a lot of troops either. We're talking less than 10,000 troops. It was ridiculous. But um, as you can see, the West was in pretty bad shape. So as far as legitimate, legitimacy goes, up to this point, I guess it really didn't matter so much because now you could say Italy and the other part of Spain, everything was taken over. This was now just under one empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Eastern Roman Empire took over rights to the West from around 553, and they held the West until 751. So on seven, in 751, obviously that will change, but up until set from 553 to 751, the Eastern Roman Empire basically held rights to both crowns. But in 751, it had to change because that empire was very hard to maintain. They didn't have a lot of troops, didn't have a lot of money. They were fighting the Persians in the east. It was very difficult. As soon as they found it all, this, this, this border area, it started withering away almost immediately. So after Justinian went away, it was pretty much done. It started going away and started shrinking as time went on. And I'll show you basically you know, what happens What happens next. On or about 751, what you see on this slide is obviously the biggest problem that's hit the Eastern Empire was the rise of Islam and, and, and against Christianity in general. So you can see that where it says Umayyad Caliphate down the bottom there. And started really tearing up the West and the East. And what you see here at this point in 751-ish, you have a um, you have the loss of most of Italy and loss of Spain, North Africa, and loss of um, the East as well. Persia actually fell to the Muslims as well, and the Byzantines were only able to. They call them Byzantines now because they're not Latin anymore; they they're Greek. So they you know, basically hang on to uh, Asia Minor, basically, and that's it, and the toe of Italy and Sicily in the islands. So what ended up happening is, since they couldn't hold on to it, they gave the Pope, at the time, gave him rights to the Western Empire. They said, hey, you take care of things in the West, we can't hold on to it. So as you see in here in Italy, you, you see the first appearance of what they call the Papal State. Papal State started in, on or about 751, and kind of ran things in... Um, in the West, they were the ones. That, even if they weren't in charge, even other countries, like you see, some other tribes in the North, they still looked at the Pope as the ruler of the Western Empire, even though they really didn't have much to do with it. So the Papal State was a legitimate piece that was broken off from the East, and the Eastern Empire said, "Hey, you can go ahead and rule the West." That was that was that's a legitimate transition. So the Papal States were in here, were the heir to the uh, Western Empire, and the Pope ruled. The Pope ruled from 751 to AD 800. We all know the significance. Of, of AD 800. What ended up happening is the, the Pope was getting a lot of trouble from the Lombards in the north of Italy. And it wasn't getting too much from the south, but from the north. And he invited the ruler of the Frankish Empire that, that Charlemagne, or Carl the Great, was putting together. And actually, as he was working his way down into Italy, he invited him in to take the Lombards and to protect the empire. That's what he said pretty much and what happened was he you know Charlemagne took over most of Italy and a huge chunk of Western Europe and he the, the story goes he was coming into the Vatican and didn't know what was going on but when he walked into the chapel the Pope crowned him as the Emperor of the West and a lot of people actually call this the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire but it depends not really some some yes some no it's actually the beginning of the Carlinian Empire, more so. It's a Frankish, it's a Frankish Empire, and it's very solid. It's a solid state ruled as an empire, as a kingdom. And Carl and his descendants, Charlemagne and his descendants, ruled that. So he took over. The Pope gave it to him. The Pope said, "Hey, you're the ruler. Crowned him himself." So basically, without any real doubt, the Carlinian Empire is the successor to the Papal States, who are obviously heirs to the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, anyway. And the Carlinian Empire existed basically from AD 800. It actually was before that, but when it became part of the Roman Empire, AD 800 to AD 962. That's a very significant date as well. The um, Carlinians ruled up until that time, but after Charlemagne, it, it Frankish had a, the Frankish kings had a habit of passing on 
their rule, their kingdoms to um, all their sons, not just one. So it split the empire a lot, and it was kind of a hectic time up until 962. It split off a few different ways and so forth, but they did unite in the end. And um, But the Carolinian Empire existed basically from 8800 to AD 962. Now the year 962 is significant, as you can see by this map here, it's dated AD 1000. Um, it's significant because Otto I, so I to say the Great, in 962, united most of the Frankish tribes or kingdoms into one empire. Um, he had a couple areas that were outside of it, uh, the Kingdom of France, which was to the left, and at that time the Kingdom of Burgundy. But the rest of it was under one ruler, and I think which encompassed basically most of the German-speaking areas, north and south, as well as most of Italy. So he's considered by many historians, myself included, as the first emperor or ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. Now this map, for whatever reason, uh, Chris McVitie likes to put German Empire. He's not incorrect at all. Um, that is a very common term for it. They change their names. I don't remember the exact name. The, I wish I had that in front of me. The exact t year that they started calling it that, but um, it's known as the Holy Roman Empire from that date on. Some say from 800. Uh, most, if not all, of the, all of those say from at least 962. And there were different types of empires there, and we won't get too deep into that, but as far as we're concerned now, it is a cognitive state. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm sorry. I'm not, my vocabulary is not so good. It, is a na it wasn't a nation state so much, but it was an empire at that point. It was a solid empire ruled by an emperor, and he dictated policy, basically. And he had a struggle with the popes all the way through. Won't get into that too much either, but the German emperor, the Holy Roman Empire at this time, was a ruler of an area of land. And he took over the area that was the Carolinian Empire. And this area that you see here was considered the Holy Roman Empire or the German Empire. And from that point on, it was one state. So it existed alongside the Byzantine Empire. The German Empire or the Holy Roman Empire at this point is the heir to the Western Roman Empire. Okay. Now this is a big time frame here, what we're talking about. So that we're saying the Holy Roman Empire existed as a state from all the way from eight uh, I'm sorry all the way from 962 all the way to 1806 so 962 AD to 1806 the Holy Roman Empire or the German Empire the first German Empire so we could say the first German Empire which it is considered the first German Empire or the first Reich you know where I'm going with this so it was, um, started in 962 and existed as a state all the way until 1806. We'll take another look here at the, this map that we've actually already seen once, but it's significant because basically the Holy Roman or the German Empire was in existence from 962 and up to the point in 14, let's say 1483, when all the remnants of the Eastern Roman Empire have been wiped out and taken over. Um, at this point, the Holy Roman Empire inher inherited all the rights to the East as well because the East no longer functions, is gone, it's totally destroyed. So from the fall of the last piece of the Eastern Empire or the Byzantine Empire goes to the West. So from this point on the German or Holy Roman Empire in the, in the West takes that over. The Ottoman Empire is not a successor or has no rights to anything from the Eastern Empire because they conquered it. So they don't get to call themselves Romans or anything like that, even though they kind of did a little bit. As well as Russia, when Constantinople fell, Russia decided that Moscow was the third Rome, but they can call it that. That's fine. That's why they started calling themselves czars. But really, legitimacy-wise, for, for who inherits what, the Western Empire inherited all rights to the East when the East went away. So from this point on, you see the Western Empire, and you also might notice that the Papal States have separated at this point from the German Empire. That's fine. They don't just separate and just assume the rights. They gave those rights away to the Holy Roman Empire, so they can pull out if they want to, but the, in the real heir to the Western Empire, and in this case the whole Roman Empire now, is the first German Empire or the Holy Roman Empire. So that's why I wanted to show you this slide. 
um, one more time. So after the east fell, uh, I have this little more focus now on the western part now, the Holy Roman Empire from that point. From about that point on, maybe the 1500s, early 1500s-ish, um, basically probably the 1400s, it, you started seeing the princes of all the little principalities inside of the empire start to run their own affairs a little bit. The big, the big one when that was the Reformation, the um, Protestant Reformation. So you had princes, and you had religious wars between Protestants and Catholics, and the big power struggle going on with inside the empire it basically rotted it away from within. It um, basically became a bunch of tiny states, up to about a thousand at one point, that were basically running their own affairs. And the emperor just kind of was a figurehead, tried to do a few things, but really couldn't get much done. And what ended up happening over time is certain certain um, countries inside of it or principalities, dukedoms and so forth, duchies, started to try to grab as much territory as possible and basically take care of themselves. And as you can see, there's a lot of states in here. One of them is called Austria, which is actually ruled by the Habsburgs. And they were one of the more successful ones. You see Brandenburg toward the top. They were uh, Austria is obviously the forefront to Austria. Brandenburg is the forefront to Germany, and they actually get their name Prussia from the little duchy to the right, which isn't even labeled on this map. It will be on the following ones. And some of these rulers inside the Holy Roman Empire actually ruled territories within and outside of the empire, which got very confusing. So the, really, the empire was kind of just there in name only. They, uh, the big joke right around this time was. For the name of the Holy Roman Empire, I forget the person that wrote about it, but basically said, Holy Roman Empire, it's neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. It was kind of a joke. So, so as you see here, this is the empire with all the states inside of it. And they varied in size. Some took over others. And obviously, as time went on, it did become less and less. As, like I said, as time goes on, some were conquered by other people and different wars that happened in that territory. Okay, this is another significant slide. This is um about the late 1600s, and as you could see, the the Holy Roman Empire is, is shrunk. Italy is kind of pulled out. A lot of the Italian states have pulled out. The Swiss Confederation or Switzerland, the first real democracy on the planet, has also pulled out. And you can also see some of the states inside that have acquired a lot of territory. And actually, some of these kingdoms, duchies, etc., have accumulated territory both inside and outside the territory. You have the Kingdom of Prussia, which used to be Brandenburg, but took over a, a Prussian, a, excuse me, a Polish fief called Prussia. So that gave him the ability to call himself king, basically is what ended up happening. So you have the Kingdom of Prussia, you have the Kingdom of Austria, or the actually at this point uh, Austria was still an archduchy, they called it. You would think it would be a kingdom, but it was actually still an archduchy. You had Saxony, Bavaria, and so forth. That was inside the Holy Roman Empire. From this point, from about 1200 on, the more or less, except for I think one instance, all of your Holy Roman Emperors were actually uh, Habsburgs or Austrian rulers. They were always elected, all the way up until the end of the um, of the Holy Roman Empire. So at this point, you can see it's kind of shrunk a little bit, and it had this form for a couple hundred years. But you can see Prussia and Austria really getting big, and Bavaria a little bit, and, and Saxony trying to hold its own. But um, you can see what's happening inside of the supposed empire at this point. But again, it's still considered the heir to the Roman Empire at this point. It's a legitimate heir that's been passed down and still holds that at this point around the end of the 1600s. Okay, this slide is very significant. This is what you can see here is how Europe looked basically right when the French Republic, after overthrowing the kingdom, and right before or right at Napoleon's takeover of France, basically, right on the eve of the French Empire. So um, it's actually, and that's also after Austria and Prussia, and Russia, you know, basically destroyed Poland, as you can see on the right. So Austria's really big, Prussia's pretty big, Austria, I mean, Russia's obviously big, and the Holy Roman Empire is right in the middle, but it's really just a, a puppet state, so for the Austrians, basically. And this is right before. The French went to war against the rest of Europe, and that was a very significant change and basically signaled the end of the Holy Roman Empire. Now we all know what happened. Well, most of us know what happened during the French Revolution, basically, in Napoleon and the French Empire. 
Napoleon basically ravaged Europe and had his continental system and basically took over all of most or all of Europe um, except for Great Britain for the most part and um, the Scandinavian countries as, as well but um, as you can see by the map here the at the Battle of Austerlitz which I believe was 1804 the basically Napoleon had a fair hand of ruling most of not all of Europe continental Europe and what he did was he right before Napoleon was able to do so the Holy Roman Empire Emperor Francis II dissolved the empire it was a legislative act or an executive act that got rid of the empire so that Napoleon couldn't take it basically is why he did it and then because he still wanted to be comparable to France he changed the Archduchy of Austria which controlled Hall, I mean uh, Hungary and a few other lands as well. Since he was no longer emperor of the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, he decided to make Austria an empire. So he declared the Austrian Empire the same day, roughly, and became Francis the First of Austria. So, so you have the Austrian Empire now, and then you have the other states of the old Holy Roman Empire that are no longer connected to each other, and basically Austria, Prussia. Saxony, Bavaria, a few other states, Württemberg, Baden. And what ended up happening is Napoleon took over all of the other areas and he made what they called the Confederation of the Rhine. Now, the Confederation of the Rhine existed for a very short time. And here's, here's where it gets a little sticky. The, some people might say, well, wh where does the heir to who, um, who takes, who, where's the succession go to after the, when the Holy Roman Empire is dissolved? It can go in two different directions. It could say that it goes to Austria because he had the same emperor and he decided just to transfer it over to Austria. I mean, obviously his capital was always Vienna anyway. So you could just say that Austria is now, as of 1804, or actually, I'm sorry, 1806, is the legitimate heir to the Roman Empire now because the Holy Roman Empire is gone. Some people might say, well, it's really the... Once he dissolved it, um, you know, Napoleon immediately created the Confederation of the Rhine, which held all the minor German states except for Austria and Prussia. So they could say the Confederation of the Rhine was the inheritor of the empire, and there was a president that was elected to the Confederation of the Rhine, and it was a puppet state of the, of the French Empire. I tend to go with Austria myself because at least it's a it's a state that had independence, and it was the same emperor. And Austria was part of the Holy Roman Empire. I, I look at Austria as being the successor state to the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrian Empire. And it kind of flows with what I'm going with next. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because what ends up happening is, in the end, obviously we know what happens. Napoleon invades Russia. He gets defeated. And they have the Congress of Vienna that kind of tries to, to tidy up the map of Europe. And basically, once that happened, this is how it worked out. So when Napoleon lost, the Congress of Vienna met together, and the major powers were basically Great Britain, Prussia, and Austria. Well, the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, and the Kingdom of Great Britain. And actually, the new government in France actually had a say in it, and a bunch of the minor states had, were present, but really, they really couldn't make many decisions. And what ended up happening is it was their attempt to tidy up the map of Europe and make it so that hopefully there wouldn't be any more war, like everybody else tries to do, but never works. So as you can see from this map, they tried to do their best. Um, obviously, it took a lot away from France, but France actually ended up not doing too badly. You had one big kingdom of the Netherlands now. Um, Switzerland was still there. The Italian states were back free again. You still had a papal state. You had a big chunk of Austrian-controlled Italy at the north northwest part of Italy. And you had your German states, but your German states were cut down by a lot. I would say, I think it's, it's definitely less than 30 you count everybody so and you had um, Austria was still there Bavaria Baden Württemberg Hanover and so forth uh, Prussia was another big state that evolved they got a lot of territory they and it had its own what they call a Rhine province on the west side as well as Bavaria had the same thing and they you know the, the victors got more territory basically is what ended up happening but what you don't see in this map and what you're going to see on the other map is what ha what the Congress of Vienna did was the Congress of Vienna decided that it was things were much better when they had a 
German Empire or a Holy Roman Empire to kind of keep a buffer state between everybody. I guess I guess that's what their goal was. I'm not sure why, but um, what you see on this map is all that what we call not nearly nation states because Austria is not really considered a nation state, but it's an empire. It's a it's a sovereign empire. So it's somebody actually rules that territory autocratically or at least by a legal government that they can tell you what to do which uh, obviously the whole Roman Empire in its last few hundred years couldn't do. So these, this is the map of all the states that exist, the sovereign states that exist. But what the Congress of Vienna did is the Congress of Vienna decided to, re to regenerate the Holy Roman Empire. So this is actually one of the, I think this is actually the only slide I have that isn't pulled out of one of Colin McVitie's books. Excuse me, I have an allergy acting up a little bit. And... Only because I just I don't think he's a big fan of of this the Holy Roman Empire type I don't know how to word that exactly I don't think he puts much much importance into it so it's not not that he's wrong it's just that what his books how his books flow doesn't relate directly to what I'm talking about but did so much for it and, I, and I, like I said I got all my maps from it but I really needed to pull this extra map out so you could see it uh, in Europe so I got this off the internet and. Um, and at least it's color. So you could see the outline of what they, what they call here the German Germanic Confederation. It's really called the German Confederation. And the um, Congress of Vienna set that up. And they set that up in 1815 as a kind of a, a buffer state or, may, or a state or maybe a form of pacifying German unity. Maybe that was it. And the... They did this to kind of emulate the Holy Roman Empire. Basically, the German Confederation is the Holy Roman Empire. I don't care what anybody says. It was set up very similarly. Instead of princes, you had you know, local – actually, you had princes. You had kings. I mean, the king of England, who had land and he was tied to Hanover, was a representative in that uh, – I think they call it a, not a parliament, but a Reichstag. And um, I believe it was in Frankfurt where they held that. And so it was still royalty. But they, for whatever reason, they decided not to use the title of emperor for the leader of the confederation. They had the leader of the confederation called the president. So the president of the confederation, though, guess who it was? It was the Austrian empire. Uh, an Austrian emperor, I'm sorry. So it was a direct descendant of the Holy Roman Empire, directly. I mean, you might, they should have just called it that. I don't know why they didn't, but I could probably read up on it and find information, but... The borders are still really the same. Austria had territory both in and outside the empire as well as Prussia. And it was almost directly it. So I consider it a direct successor of it. So the, they brought it back. And you can claim legitimacy because the Austrian emperor went ahead and held that title. So he transferred that role to the German Confederation. He willingly did that. So the German Confederation now took, it over, took the succession over from the Austrian emperor, empire in 1815. So um, the Austrian or the um, I'm sorry the Austrian or the Confederation of the Rhine, whatever you want to argue, only existed from 1806 to 1815 as far as a legitimate heir. So it doesn't matter so much because in 1815 the German Confederation took over that role and and basically held that role till 1866. Yes, there was a period of time 1849, 1850-ish, where there was they didn't meet. There was no real there was some revolutions going on, but it re it reunified itself and came back and existed until 1866. Now, so you can see here the purpose or the, the, it's very important to understand the German Confederation is basically the Holy Roman Empire reborn. And it transfers itself, Austria held it as kind of like a protector until Napoleon went away and then brought it back again. So they are the legitimate heir of the Roman Empire. Okay, it's a direct, it's a direct line. So, and, but unfortunately for them, that ended in 1866 and we're going to go ahead and show and talk about why. In 1866, what ended up happening is you had two major powers vying for control of Germany, basically, Austria and Prussia. Austria had the upper hand all the way up until 1866, but what ended up happening there is the growing kingdom of Prussia, led by Chancellor Bismarck, with his king, Kaiser Wilhelm I, went after and started a struggle in Europe, and basically what ended up happening is Austria and Prussia disagreed. And they went to war. What ended up happening is Prussia went to war against the the German Confederation and Austria. So basically went to war against everybody. This is considered a civil war because it's within the German Confederation. 
two powers within the German Confederation fighting it out for control of it. So since it is a civil war, whoever wins, their legitimacy stays with them. What ended up happening is, <laughs> I think it was six or seven weeks, Prussia invaded uh, Austria, or near where Czechoslovakia is now, Bohemia, and basically all their armies surrounded Austria, and within a few weeks they were, at the, they were, they were besieging Vienna, and uh, Francis Joseph I, the Emperor of Austria, decided to uh, surrender, and what ended up happening is Prussia became the leader of Germany, of the German people anyway, and what ended up happening is the peace treaty was, the way the peace treaty was written, the German Confederation in 1866 was, was gone away, it uh, ceased to exist, and what happened is, and this is very significant, the settlement for the treaty was every, every German nation of, north of the Main River had to join a North German Confederation with Prussia, and Prussia had control over it. They all had a vote, but basically the ruler of Prussia, the president, sorry, the president of the North German Confederation was the Prussian um, Prussian king, basically. So as you can see by the map, everything above the Main River was in the North German Confederation. You had the German states south of it, Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden, which were allowed to keep their sovereignty, their full sovereignty, and they were actually allied more allied more with Austria. And then obviously Austria was not part of the North German Confederation. So now you have a separation. And the North German Confederation was actually a, a, a sovereign state. It actually, you belonged to it and that's what you were part of. So, so now you have the North German Confederation. And that existed, basically the North German Confederation existed from 1866 until 1871. And in 1871 there was another big event that happened as well. In 1871... Chancellor Otto von Bismarck maneuvered his way into, and he was very good at this, he needed Germany to be united so that he knew his way to unite the southern German states was to provoke a war against France. And when he did that, he had to get the loyalty of the southern German states. They invaded France, 1871, the Franco-Prussian, they call it the Franco-Prussian War, but really it was a Franco-German War. And basically the the North German Confederation, along with the South German states, not Austria, Austria's out of the picture now, went and invaded France, and everybody thought France would win, and they lost. And when they lost, the Bavarian king, Ludwig II, sent a letter and decided, told the other princes, basically, that they should make Kaiser Wilhelm I the German emperor. And all the southern German states joined the North German Confederation, and you have the beginning of Imperial Germany, the German Empire, in this case the Second German Empire, or the Second Reich. And in 1871, the Second German Empire was proclaimed with Kaiser Wilhelm as its leader. And then you have a united Germany, pretty much, except for Austria, because Austria is German, but it had its own state. So you had a pretty much a united Germany. And that existed in, its, in, its, in, its, in, the, in that form from 1871 all the way until 1918. Now, 1918 significant, or 1914, let's say significant, but was what ended up happening, and this is not a story about World War I, but we'll talk about it real quickly. All these states, uh, nationalism was very high, everybody thought they were better than everybody else, and it took a little trigger, somebody getting assassinated in Serbia, not Serbia, but uh, Bosnia, and started a war, and everybody took a side, and you had the central powers against the uh, Entente, they call it. Sorry. I'll get that in a second. Sorry about that. And basically they went to war and you had World War I. World War I wasn't, wasn't too kind to the Central Powers and looked like they were going to do pretty well. As you can see from this uh, real quick slide, they had Germany, Austria, and Ottoman Empire basically against the rest of the world. And they did okay. But as 1918 was rolling around, the Americans got involved with the war. Then things didn't go so well. The Ottoman Empire broke up. The Austrian and Hungarian Empire at this time it was called, but they broke up as well um, into all separate states. And Germany was punished very, uh, very severely. So the and this would end uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm II at the end of World War One abdicated, and they formed a new government. So that was pretty much the end of the Second German Empire. So at the end of World War One, what ended up happening is. And this is important. Germany actually didn't fare as bad as its allies did. Uh, 
Austria-Hungary went away. As you can see, it's only a small state now taken over by a um, Republican form of government. Ottoman Empire was totally broken up, and the same thing happened there. But Germany stayed stayed intact. They lost. They obviously took some territory away from them and recreated the state of Poland. And um, they basically got rid of their monarchy. And Germany was invaded at this point. They, except for the the Rhineland, was kind of taken over, but that was just part of the treaty. So. They, you know, told Germany they couldn't have an air force, and they told they were trying to make sure they didn't start another war down the down the line. So, the Second German Empire gave way to the Weimar Republic, and the Weimar Republic existed from 1918 until 1933. But because it took over from the monarchy, monarchy, and it still retained its sovereignty, it's considered a successor state. So at this point, the Weimar Republic is an heir to the Roman Empire. Real simple. But in 1933, that's another significant year. That did all change. 1933, Adolf Hitler, who was chancellor, elected an elected official, had a pretty much a bloodless coup and took over the empire, or took over the republic. Hindenburg, the president, died, and he took over duties and basically morphed it into a dictatorship. And Germany went from being a republic to another empire again, Nazi Germany. And that started in 1933. You can see on this map as they started their expansion. I look at this as, as a significant map because that this is when they took over Austria, which I think was 1938, I believe it was, 1938, and took over Austria as well as the Sedontland, which is outside of Czechoslovakia, and the capitulation at Munich, they call it, where the West basically gave, let Hitler get away with it and didn't want to go to war. They ended up going to war anyway, went into World War II, the expansion of Germany again, the Third German Empire, or the Third Reich, we all know what that means. And again, this Third German Empire, the Third Reich, was a successor state to Germany, which means it was an heir to the Roman Empire, legitimate heir. Follows a line of succession. And so Hitler's Germany was in that line, and they obviously, World War II and that whole, I'm not going to go into World War II, I won't even show a map of it, we all know what happens. They started taking over a lot of areas of Europe, and then the fall of the Third Reich, they, the Allies went in, took over, and Battle of Berlin, and all of that, and Hitler committing suicide. So what ended up happening here is Germany ran from 1933, I mean the, the, the Nazi Germany, the Third Empire, the Third Reich, from 1933 until 1945. And again, 1945 is another very important date in our, in our study here. Okay, I'm not going to go really deep into World War II, but basically at the end of World War II, the two dominant powers were the United States and Russia, or the Soviet Union at that time. And... You know, Soviet Union had its interests in the East, and we had our interests in the West. And what ended up happening is Winston Churchill called an Iron Curtain was across Europe for the most part. So what ended up happening in Germany, and this is important, Germany was invaded. However, at least the West, and I'm pretty sure the East as well, they just couldn't agree how Germany should be governed. And a Republican form of government formed in the West and they decided they weren't going to agree because what happened is the, the Allies of World War II divided Germany between sectors of control, the Russian zone, the American zone, the British zone, and then they had the French zone. So the Western powers, Russia, I mean, sorry, United States, Great Britain, or United Kingdom, and France had their areas merge and form West Germany, or the Federal Republic of Germany, which was West Germany. The Soviet Union went ahead and formed a government in East Germany called the People's Democratic Republic of Germany, or East Germany. West Berlin was also divided. I'm sorry, Berlin was divided between all three, all four zones at the time. So the Russian zone was on the east, which became the capital of East Germany. And then the Western zone, American, uh, United Kingdom, and France merged and became West Berlin. West Berlin was kind of sort of part of West Germany. Um, I guess for discussion today we'll call it that. But it was kind of its own entity as well. But it was a Western state inside of the Iron Curtain, basically. And actually I was stationed there myself, or not in West Berlin. I was supposed to go to West Berlin. I was actually in West Germany. I'm a little old. So <laughs> it was a, definitely a weird time. So the West German government existed. And the East German government existed, so you could say that both of those governments, because Germany didn't go away, even though it was invaded, it still was allowed to exist. 
So you, there was never any, Germany was never considered part of France or Poland or Russia or whatever. It always had its own state. But it was divided east and west. So both of those states had a government now, unfortunately. And they both could claim legitimate succession to the Roman Empire. So those two states existed from roughly 1945 until 1990. 1990 was very significant. I was actually over there when this happened. <laughs> And when the Berlin Wall came down and basically things started falling apart in Eastern Europe, and what ended up happening is this basic communism was, was failing. And so East and West obviously always wanted to come back together. It was going to be who was going to be in charge. So what you're going to see now is basically what ended up happening. In 1990, when a lot of states were falling in the East, basically what ended up happening is East Germany petitioned to join the the Federal Republic, excuse me, the Federal Republic of Germany. So the People's Democratic Republic of Germany ceased to exist. The government folded, and the territory joined the Republic of Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, and the capital was moved to Berlin. And now you had one German state again. This one German state, which has been in existence since 1990 as a state, is the heir and legitimate successor to the Roman Empire. So all you people out there that, you know, look at prophecy and things out of the Judeo-Christian tradition as far as what the Kingdom of the North and the Roman Emperor and all this, um, here is your line of succession. I mean, I think it's very, again, it's uh, I like to keep it simple like a, the whole title of the series that I'm doing. And I don't think there's much argument into that who can really dispute some of that. There's a couple points I went into that maybe could be disputed, but... Not really. I just don't see. I think this is very simple and easy to understand, I hope. And I encourage you to watch it again or any comments that you're, I'm interested in, your feelings, if you want to put them down. And um, please hopefully keep them, you know, <laughs> no four-letter words or anything, anybody. I, wanna, I, don't, see, I, wanna get, I know this is worldwide. I don't want to get any other nationalities mad at me or anything either. I don't care either way. I'm not a German. I'm not an Italian. I'm, not, I'm an American, but, you know, I don't, I don't have any feelings on this one way or the other. I just found it interesting. I'm an historical student and um, I just found this very interesting and I think it, it has war it has merit. This case has merit. Does it mean anything? <sighs> Probably not. <laughs> but you know, if you're into monarchies and how you know, legitimate heirs and all that kind of stuff, maybe you find it interesting. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it was kinda of long. Um, again I gotta say Colin McVitie's books, I, if you like maps and history, they're wonderful. I would definitely recommend going out and getting some, getting some of his books. They still sell all of them, and you can get them at a lot of bookstores and, and, and online as well. So thank you, and I do appreciate you watching.